In nomenclature one, I'm going to talk to you about naming and writing ionic compounds. First and foremost, go ahead and get your periodic table out, and I want you to sketch in everything you see onto the screen directly onto your periodic table. So you'll need to pause the video to go ahead and do that at this time. I'm going to be going through the periodic basics to lay a foundation for naming chemical compounds. First, all species to the left of the stairs are metals. Now I've used blue to indicate them on the screen. All species to the right of the stairs are nonmetals. They are in green. And then the chemical species that you see that are in white along the stairs, those are known as the metalloids. Now, you may recall that as you move from left to right across the periodic table, we have something called a period. Whereas if you move vertically, say down the periodic table, we have something called a group or a family. Now, speaking of groups, there's a, a few groups I want you to label right now. Group one and group two to start with. Group one referred to as the alkali metals. Group two referred to as the alkaline earth metals. Now remember, that includes all of the elements extending vertically. So group two would have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, etc. Also, Boxed in red, we have the transition metals. So all of those elements we'll refer to as the transition metals. Ions are when atoms or groups of atoms gain or lose electrons. Now remember, electrons are those negatively charged subatomic particles. So it makes sense that if an atom were to lose or give away electrons that it would become positively charged, whereas an atom that is gaining electrons would become negatively charged. And metals assume positive charge as non-metals assume a negative charge. Now, plus one, plus two, plus three, and skip minus three, minus two, minus one, and zip. I want you to write that on your periodic table if you haven't already done so. These are the charges that correspond to these groups. Now you may notice I have omitted the transition metals and that was done on purpose. We'll be talking about them in upcoming videos. In class, we're gonna have a little saying that goes like this plus one, plus two, plus three, skip. Minus three, minus two, minus one, zip. Now let me explain what that means. It's fairly intuitive. The plus one, plus two, plus three, those families will have positive three charge. Skip means just what it, it says. For now, we're just gonna ignore the poor carbon family and skip it. Then we start at minus three, we go minus two, minus one, and then we have zip. Now, some of the intuition behind this deals with periodicity and bonding. And those are units that I'll go into detail in later on in this course. So for now, I'm asking you to simply number your periodic table, remember our little chant here so that you can readily recall the charges of these families when naming ionic compounds. So when we get to talking about nomenclature, nomenclature is the process of naming chemical species. Now you remember, say, binomial nomenclature in biology, it was a naming system as well. This is a system used for naming chemical compounds. Ionic compounds specifically are compounds composed of a metal and a non-metal, which is why I'm making a really big deal out of being able to teach you how to readily distinguish between the chemical species that are metallic versus non-metallic, and it's very simple. It has to do, are we on the left or right of these stairs here? There are uh, basic knowledge for the metals and non-metals and some terminology that I wanna briefly discuss with you. So metals, as we've already 
discussed tend to lose electrons. Well, when they lose electrons, they assume a positive charge. We'll refer to those charged ions as cations, whereas nonmetals, which tend to accept electrons and become negatively charged, let's call those anions. Now in class, I'm gonna ask you a set of questions. And at first, this might seem a bit odd, but it is absolutely critical that you do the following. And I will adjust these questions throughout the next three podcasts. So by the time we get through them, you all will be experts at naming and writing compounds. Question one, hey, did you look at the periodic table? You have to look at it for me and see to the left, to the right, because you need to identify those species because that will then identify which method you're going to be using. Now in this video, we're looking at metals and nonmetals. So the answer is yes, I've looked at it. Question two, are both species to the right of the stairs? You're gonna say no because we're naming ionic compounds, and by definition, ionic compounds are composed of a metal and a non-metal. Then I'll simply say, guys, you're naming ionic compounds. It is that simple. Let me show you how easy this is. First, we're going to look at two rules that I want you to use. Rule number one, when naming ionic compounds, say the name of the metal, which is the cation, followed by the name of the nonmetal, but the nonmetal will now end in the suffix "-ide". Now, you might be wondering what these uh, terms mean. I'm going to elucidate that in the next video, but for now, just know that we're naming ionic compounds that only have a single charge, okay? So let's do a practice problem here. Sodium chloride. Okay, now remember the questions. Did you look at the periodic table? Well, of course, we're looking at it right now. Are both species to the right of the stairs? No, they're not. One is on the left, one is on the right. That means we're naming ionic compounds. So we're gonna say the metal, sodium. Then we're gonna say the name of the anion, which is chlorine but instead of I-N-E, we're gonna put in the suffix I-D-E, sodium chloride. Let's now look at calcium, which is a group two alkaline earth metal, sulfide, calcium, sulfide. Now, sulfur is the element I've circled on the right of the stairs, but remember, we're gonna use the prefix I-D-E which indicates it's an anion, in this case, calcium sulfide. Let's look at this one, sodium phosphide. And you're probably saying, hey, where'd the rest of the periodic table go? Guess what? We don't need that portion, the transition metals, because the transition metals have more than one charge, at least some of them do. And so that's the next video. So now we've made it even easier. We're dealing with group one and group two metals and then species to the right of the stairs, all right? We also have our group three metals as well that we'll be looking at in this video. Sodium phosphide, sodium phosphide, sodium phosphide. Okay, let's look at the charges. Sodium has a plus one, and you might say, how do we know that? Well, that's the purpose of writing these numbers above the periodic table. However, I do wanna say that we don't write the one, we only put the plus sign. It is implied if there's one plus sign that it's plus one, so we do not include the one for this entire group one family. We only put the plus sign and that entire family has a plus one charge, okay? So next, phosphorus. Phosphorus, 
or phosphide, has a negative three charge. It is in this group here, the nitrogen group, and it has a minus three above it. And again, that's something I will talk to you about a little later on in the course. But first, we have to just learn how to name compounds. Here, I'm indicating the phosphide anion with its three charges. I'm doing this to give you a visual representation of bonding, a little bit of more intuition for naming ionic compounds. The goal here is I wanna try to cancel or neutralize those charges. I want them to balance. So I have three negative charges for one phosphide anion. I'm gonna add one sodium. Is it balanced? No, of course not, because I still have these two negative charges here. So let me add another one. Still not balanced. Let me add a third sodium. Now you can see I have three pluses, I have three minuses, I have three sodiums, but only one phosphide anion. This is the correct formula for sodium phosphide. And I'm going to talk to you now about the subscript. The subscript indicates the number of sodium atoms. Here you can see there's a three. Now the subscript comes after the atom. So that is indicating that there are three sodiums, just as I showed you in the visual representation. There were three sodiums there. Now, just as I talked about with the superscript of plus one only using the sign, same applies for the subscript phosphorus. There's only one phosphide anion. Notice I didn't put a one here, okay? That's because you do not include the one. It is implied that there is one phosphide anion in this formula. One atom of phosphorus, three atoms of sodium, written as Na subscript three, capital P. Again, look at our charges. What happened to them? Well, they canceled, they balanced, leading to an overall compound that is neutral called sodium phosphide. The charges of those cations and anions for the last time to reiterate it to you, they must balance or cancel one another out. All right, so let's get a little more practice here. Let's look at this one here. So we have strontium and we have chlorine. Strontium is a group two metal, therefore strontium has a positive plus two charge. Whereas chlorine, which is a nonmetal to the right of the stairs, has a negative one charge, as does the whole halogen family. So let's say this compound, we're going to say the metal, strontium, followed by the name of the nonmetal, which is chlorine, but we're going to use the suffix ide. Strontium chloride. Now let's look at those charges again. Strontium is plus two. Chlorine is minus one, but we don't show the one there. Let's get a visual representation. Here's one atom of strontium in its charged cationic form. I'm showing both of the positive charges. And again, what we're gonna try to do is cancel or balance those charges. Let's bring in one chlorine. Okay. We've canceled these guys, but we still have an overall net positive charge. So let's bring in another chlorine. And now you can see we've balanced the positive and the negative. And we have, for every one strontium, we have two chlorine. The metals always go first when writing ionic compounds. And then the nonmetal goes afterwards. And because there are two chlorine, I'm using the subscript of two the two applies to the chlorine. There's a one here, but we don't write that one. It is implied. Let's look at another example here. Here we have a group one metal called rubidium. And then we have fluorine, another member of the halogen family. So 
We're going to say the metal, rubidium. We're going to say the non-metal ending in ide, fluoride. This is rubidium fluoride. Let's look at the charges. Rubidium has a plus one. So does the whole group or family. I hope that's become very clear by now. And fluorine has a negative one charge. So does the entire group or family. Let's get a visual on balancing these charges so they cancel. We have one rubidium with its plus one charge, and we need one fluorine with its minus one charge to give us rubidium fluoride. Now we're going to look at another example. This particular example, I'm going to have you try to write the ionic compound. First and foremost, our metal is magnesium. Go ahead and find magnesium on the periodic table and indicate its charge. Next, the anion is nitride. Nitride. Go ahead and find that on the periodic table and indicate its charge. So what we have is magnesium, which is a group two, which has a plus two charge, and nitrogen, which has a minus three charge is our anion, and we have to now find a way to balance these charges so they cancel out. You might be seeing this one is not as straightforward as the previous examples. Let's do our visual representation. Here's one ion of magnesium with its plus two. Okay, let's add a nitride anion. All right, and if we're doing where we're canceling charges here, I'm gonna put a little mark through. Okay, this isn't working because we're left over with a negative one charge. Let's bring in another magnesium so we can take care of that. Oh, oh, now we have a plus one charge. Let's bring in another nitride anion so that we can cancel these out. Oh my goodness, now we're left with a minus two charge, but wait. If we bring in one final magnesium cation, we can balance or cancel all of the charges leading to an overall neutral compound. So our formula for magnesium nitride is Mg subscript three in subscript two. So we're using two subscripts in this case one for the magnesium and one for the nitrogen. Now, one easy way to do these is to look at a common factor. If we make the charge six, which is what we've done here, if you count the pluses and minuses, you can um, balance out these charges. Here's something that I've seen uh, from time to time, and I'm going to go ahead and teach it to you. However, the most important thing to me is you have a conceptual understanding for how these charges balance each other out. Some students use this method and they don't really know why. It's called the crisscross method. So you're going to take your three in the charge of the nitrogen and you're going to send it over there. Then you're going to take your two, which is the charge of the magnesium, and you're going to send it over here and that's actually going to give you your chemical formula for magnesium nitride. This is the crisscross method. Absolutely use it if, it if it helps you, but I'm more concerned about the conceptual understanding of how these charges balance. In this video, we've touched on our Georgia Standards of Excellence which deal with chemical names and something called IUPAC nomenclature, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. There's that word nomenclature, which is a naming system. And of course, in this video, you've learned how to name binary ionic compounds. And I'll see you guys in class.